I set out to before the end of 2019, review all three parts of the last major adaptation of a cyberpunk tabletop role-playing game into video game form, Shadowrun Returns, and its two sequel campaigns, Dragonfall and Hong Kong. Well, it's cutting in just under the wire, but I beat this game a while back and did a prose review on my blog, but not all y'all go there, so I figure let you, uh, my YouTube viewers, know as well my thoughts on Shadowrun Hong Kong. The first two parts of what I call the Shadowrun Returns trilogy, Shadowrun Dead Man Switch and Shadowrun Dragonfall, showed a steady improvement over their earlier installments, reaching a zenith in this game, Shadowrun Hong Kong. Dead Man Switch reintroduced the game mechanics of World and World of Shadowrun to video games after decades of absence. I don't count the multiplayer first-person shooter, along with telling a story that adapted parts of the setting that hadn't been touched on before. Dragonfall, for the first time, took Shadowrun in video game form. It already been out of the out for in the tabletop game out of Seattle, and in the process gave some fan service to the game's very very vocal German fan base. Seriously, you'll hear lots of Shadowrun English language Shadowrun fans complaining about how Germany gets the best Shadowrun books. It also demonstrated elements of the evolution of PC RPGs that the first game lacked. Regular party members, each with their own distinct motivations and story, along with quests to those characters that help them uh, progress their story. However, both games had some mechanical hiccups that made them frustrating to play. Shadowrun Hong Kong fixes a lot of these hiccups. Probably the biggest one is related to inventory management. There were few things more frustrating from the first two games than finding a particularly nice grenade, or med pack, or weapon, or mainly grenades and med packs, with characters who could absolutely use that item and were indeed best suited for that item and had open inventory slots, but where you couldn't pick that item up because you personally did not have those open inventory slots. Similarly, your character could have characters in the group who had the skills needed to surpass some particular skill challenges, biotech, rigging, decking, but if you personally did not, it could not be performed. You needed to be not only a jack-of-all-trades, but a master-of-all-trades to be able to circumvent a lot of the combat situations in the game. In Shadowrun Hong Kong, on the other hand, this is resolved. If you have a decker in the party, you can hack that door. you got a rigger, you can shut down those turrets and put yourself in a more strategically superior situation or evade combat entirely. You have a spellcaster entirely, you can go find out what's so weird about this place's aura and learn more about the lore and the sto and the overall motivations behind a particular mission. It makes talking your way out of encounters more viable than in earlier games. It makes it more possible to do, if not a no-kill playthrough, than a minimal kill playthrough, because you have what it takes to circumvent those obstacles. Decking has also changed considerably, though this is more of a mixed bag. Decking is no longer exclusively turn-based. Instead, the game uses real-time stealth gameplay, with the decker having to evade the vision cones of various detection ice, with the game moving into turn-based combat if you are spotted, or when you are um, trigger certain fixed encounters. All action when you're in stealth mode counts as one turn. Now, this means if you have a time limit to accomplish a task, then if you're careful and take your time, you can complete that sequence in only a couple of in-game combat turns. But if you hit combat, if you run into Matrix combat a lot, then it will take you more game time in or combat rounds to complete the task. That said, there are some issues with the enemy patterns, where it becomes far too easy to accidentally blunder in an enemy when traversing an area on the first time. The point that when I started running into time sequences, I would end up heavily save scumming to minimize the time I spent in combat. This is also made fr uh, somewhat frustrating by the fact that the programs that you can equip and to heal your character and reduce the heat level of the server can't be used when you're not in combat, as opposed to the first two games when you can use them whenever you're decked in, which is very useful if you have a tough combat scene. You're right about sequence. You're about right about where you need to be to um, activate your power to heal your program to heal yourself or reduce the threat on the server, and you can't do it because you've completed the combat. Another development of the game is with the writing. This is a significant improvement. In the first two games, your character was effectively a cipher. They have a background that you determine through your dialogue. Rather, Another improvement with this game is with the writing. 
In the first two games, your character was a cipher. They had very little background. It might get played with a little bit. Like, for example, Dead Man Switch, you had previously run with the titular dead character. Um, but here, you're, you have a family and connections that drive the plot. You have a brother who is an active party member, of, or their adoptive brother, who is an active member of the party. And actually, in, in my case, while I played an elf character, I do admit it might be possible that your, your brother character is a troll. Um, if you, like, it's entirely possible that this geek could be a biological character if you pick up also another troll. I don't know. Um, in any case, they have a background that you determine through your dialogue choices with your adoptive brother and other characters about what your life in the past was like and, and, what, and how you grew up together. And those choices are reflected in later dialogue with your brother and your father figure, who is the person who drives the plot as well and who you're trying to find. It provides a very organic way to develop what your character is like in terms of their personality um, beyond just straight, the straight dialogue choices of, par of effectively Paragon, Renegade, um, threatening, smartass, noble, that, or, or, or upright, that sort of thing. And speaking of your adoptive brother, again, he plays, he's a party member and he plays a very major role in the game's plot. And what, and your decisions you make will act very heavily impact how he reacts to you and reacts to the game's story. And also in turn, because of this, your relationship with him and your, and both of your relationship with your adoptive father. While Dragonfall had definitely had some narrative agency in terms of the overarching main thrust of the plot, you had very little control over characterization to this extent. You aren't just determining what you are. You are in turn fleshing out your fellow, your joint party member of your brother. And this is all of this on top of the variety of party members and their personal plot arcs that will in turn lead into their loyalty missions, as with Shadowrun Dragonfall. In all, I really love this game, and I really hope that the mechanical improvements that are shown in this game are carried over into future staff, future small well, Shadowrun campaigns. But what you mean? I want more Shadowrun campaigns. I'm trying to say, um, yes, Harebrain Schemed is putting a lot of focus on BattleTech lately with a new expansion for that coming out. But still, I'd like to see more. I like Shadowrun a lot. It's one of the first RPGs I actively sought out outside of Dungeons and Dragons and GURPS. So it's a game that it's near and dear to my heart. And the progression and development over the past, well, three campaigns has been dramatic. Um, with, again, Channel Hong Kong, it's probably the closest we've gotten to a sort of Pillars of Eternity or, um, uh, well, the, um, Divinity Original Sin of Shadowrun games, basically. It has, like, it doesn't have quite the free from free flowing combat of, uh, Shadowrun, uh, no, Shadowrun, but of, um, Divinity Original Sin, or how combat works in, uh, Pillars of Eternity, instead of going for something more kind of grid-based, like an XCOM, as with the other, uh, this is with the whole Shadowrun, uh, series. But it works, and it works well. And you don't get a lot of games like this. Yes, we have the Divinity series. Yes, we have, um, or rather I should say, the Divinity Original Sin series in the Pillars of Eternity series. And presumably, Baldur's Gate 3 is going to do something similar with how it mechanically does its does the game as well. But still, like, those are all fantasy role-playing games. Um, when, it, when, we get in, when we get into the, the... And yes, Shadowrun is fantasy. There's elves and trolls and orcs and magic. But it's also science fiction. It's, it's cyberpunk. And there aren't a lot of games in that space doing that thing. CD Projekt Red's Cyberpunk is definitely leaning closer in certain extent, certain ways, to the Outer Worlds 
Fallout New Vegas. You're in the first person. You develop your character through dialogue choices, yes, but it's you are less developing the tone of your character through those dialogue choices in a meaningful sense. You aren't building a backstory through your character through the dialogue decisions you make in those two games. In fact, for um, New Vegas and Outer Worlds, effectively your character is, and intentionally so, a cipher. Now, Shadowrun, rather, uh, Cyberpunk is using the life path system that is from the tabletop game, and so presumably that will come up in play as well. But I do would still like to have more than that um, option to flesh out your character further through the dialogue decisions you make and have the dialogue decisions that you choose develop your character's personality further as well. Uh, like with, with Shadowrun Hong Kong, actually a lot like, well, Dragon Age 2, I did get this sense with my dialogue choice that while my character was not voiced, in fact, none of the party members in the game are voiced, I did get the sense that the decisions I was making with my dialogue were, like, were fleshing out the way my character was perceived. And I had like a sense of, okay, my character is professional, or he's a smartass, or in the hybrid state of you're a smartass professional, much as like with in Dragon Age 2, you pick enough snarky things, then even when you pick a serious option, or a professional option, or an angry option, the dialogue choice that you're, like, the, the fleshed out dialogues you're going to choose is going to be conducive with um, the dialogue choices that you, that you made before. So, in Dragon Age 2, for example, if you've been picking lots of smart-ass options up to this point, we decide to pick the mad option, because, oh, you're fighting slavers now, or you're fighting Templars now, and you're an L, and you're, you're protective of your um, mage uh, sister. Sibling, sister, brother, however, thing, uh, sister normally. Um, then when you pick that option, you get, um, like, it won't be, you won't be going, um, light smartest remark, light smartest remark, light smartest remark, dark, grim, dark, serious, angry remark. It's more, when you pick the threatening option, it'll be, after after going smartest remark, smartest remark, smartest remark, you go threatening. It will be smartassly threatening remark. Um, you are more like your remark is more likely to be more likely to be. Ah, I'm going. You're going to die by being run over by a zamboni, as opposed to as opposed as opposed to um. Or, and I'm trying to kill you with a forklift, something like that, as opposed to, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, opposed to, like, something, like, you're, you're, you're smart assy, you're more, you're, you're threatening your marks will lean more cable, than as opposed to if you're playing all serious and straight, then your remarks will, will play more John Wick or cable, to put it another way, on, on the, the cable Deadpool spectrum, if you will. So I hope CD Projekt Red takes cues from this, and to a certain degree, the idea of the the Tony Cap spec, the Tony Cap spectrum, or the actually let's just a spectrum like if you're going to do the spider web graph of like you've got the cap, the Captain America up here, the Iron Man over the the uh, Deadpool over here, the Iron Man here, and the Cable here, or the John Wick here, um, in terms of Actually, like the the cable here, and then how things play out, where like you have John Wick in between Captain America and Dead and Cable, um, you have um like Ant Man in between Tony Stark and uh and a Deadpool, that sort of thing, or it could be technically Scott Lang, but there's two Ant Men. You get what I mean. So, in any case, 
I, I love this game. And I definitely, coming out of this, without having seen too much more of the gameplay footage of Cyberpunk, I'm definitely now going into Cyberpunk with not necessarily expectations of what of what Cyberpunk will be, but more, I now have a better understanding now of what I want from Cyberpunk. So, if nothing else, this was a very edifying experience of going through this evolution, of this evolution going, okay, what is it in, like, New Vegas and Dragon Age and the Mass Effect games and now Shadowrun Dragonfall, where it's like, okay, when it comes to building a world and developing a character and playing out, like, the life and career of a Shadowrunner and an Edge Runner, what is it I want? What is it I like and I want? And Shadowrun... Shadowrun Hong Kong gets to the root of what I want with the party members and loyalty missions that we got from Dragonfall with a more fleshed out character backstory and how it fits into the plot. Not just in the sense of, oh, you are picking your backstory and having that play out in your dialogue, in like, you like Kaylee fleshing out dialogue options, but the fact that you have but you have characters who know you from way back, who are an active part of the story, who you're talking to at your base of operations and on missions, who react to your decisions and toy choices, and by having them being a part of these decisions and you being having gone through these dialogues with them and fleshed out your backstory before, that plays into how the story plays out, what choices you have, and what actions those characters make. Not just in the, in the loyalty missions, oh, I trust you sense, but in the I'm your brother or your mate, your 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 your, your buddy, like I say mate in the British sense, I'm your mate. Um or what have you, we have a history together beyond just what's happened in this game, which we fleshed out through dialogue choices between each other, in terms of the particulars of that, and I can and less consequently, we have dialogue choices that call back not just on what I've done before, I'm, I'm trying to frame this properly with the camera, with what I've done before with the life path system, but going beyond that to we have the life path that impacts where we where I'm our starting values for our background characters in Cyberpunk. During the game, I use dialogue choices to flesh those points out further. Not just, oh, this is my buddy I knew from a gang, this is my adoptive brother from a foster home, this is my actual biological family member, or a parental figure, or actual parent, or first boss, or whatever. We have this history. My dialogue choices then info take that, inform it further, create moments which, later on in the game, we can call back to. Shadowrun Hong Kong says, this can be done. We can do this. It is possible. We can do it. And we can do it in a not necessarily big budget way. Because the, all of these Shadowrun games are not graphically intensive. They are not, like, they are, they cost money. They are, they, but they are, they are, they are A, they're not AAA games. They're A games. They are what A games would have been back in the day. And we can do it with that, which means hopefully Cyberpunk will try to do this too. And I hope to God they do. Um I think like this development of character and or execution of development of character over the course of a game, and the way it is executed in Shatter and Hong Kong. It's something like Mass Effect didn't do this at all. You like, yeah, you picked your story, your background in the first game. There'd be little bits and pieces that would call back to it, but it never was a factor. Same with Mass Effect Andromeda. Um, same even with Dragon Age, too. Uh, it kind of, it came up with Dragon Age Origins because the Origins part was a part was a key central point of the game. I didn't come up with any, but not so much for the rest of it. Um, like, and even in the origins, it's it's you had the prologue chapter 
like it, it's through the it's through the decisions you make in the prologue chapter within the game itself calling back later you're not writing your backstory in the same way and CD Projekt Red I've always gotten the impression and the fact that they picked Shadowrun they picked Cyberpunk Artel's Oregon game Cyberpunk as a game they wanted to do as a license they wanted to pursue says that they have a tabletop background as well that it's my hope that CDPR goes like that they played Shadowrun Hong Kong or they played lots of other games and looked at mechanics and they, they like and say yeah this is a good idea it is worth imitating we're not cloning these systems we're not trying to reverse engineer the code or anything like that but this is a good idea and one that should propagate We've occasionally had games that have had similarly really good ideas that didn't catch on. The Nemesis system from the Lord of the Rings Shadows games. That's a good idea that never really caught on anywhere else, like another game from the same developer. I hope, I really hope this catches on here. Like, like this is an idea that catches on for role-playing games in a big way. We shall see. Particularly as we get closer to Cyberpunk's release. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 